with those around you. Just take someone's hands, everyone, on your right and your left. Tell your neighbors, good to touch an original. <laughs> 7.2 billion people on earth today, and no one has your fingerprint. Squeeze that hand just a little bit. Hey, neighbor, that's original stuff right there. <laughs> the value of a thing in life is determined by a principle called rarity. Rarity means the more rare a thing is, the higher the value. And this is why gold is so rare and so valuable. Diamonds are so valuable. Rocks are so cheap. <laughs> and God wanted you to be permanently valuable. So he gave you a DNA coding with a chromosome combination that produced a fingerprint that doesn't exist anywhere among seven billion people. You are permanently valuable. Don't ever devalue yourself. Let no one's opinion tell you how much you're worth. Do not depend on people's assessment to determine how important you are. Look at your finger every week and just say, that is original. <laughs> Father, speak to us. Change us completely today. We came from different places, but we are on the same journey. We want to know the truth. Give us another glimpse of truth today. And Lord, you changed Jacob's life in one night and turned him into Israel. What can a God do in one day? Do it in this room today. And I will give you all the credit and the authority of our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shake hands with three people. Tell them, watch me change right before your eyes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Great to have all of you joining us. You may be seated. I want to welcome all of you joining us on our live stream here from the CBN premises and of course all the workers here. I've gotten to know some of you being coming here for years. I haven't seen you for a long time. I miss you. But I've been traveling to over 102 countries the last uh, few years. I've been working very hard. And my wife and I, please stand. This is my wife, Ruth. And she is the most... She's the most important person in my life, even more important than my mother. And we've been married for 33 years this year. And I am very proud to say that she's the mother of my only two children on the planet. And uh, we have been working together. We travel together all the time. We work as a team. And the Lord has given us the grace to build a global ministry and we still live on the island called New Providence in the Bahamas where God lives. Uh, this is prayer week at CBN. And I want to talk to you about prayer. But I want to talk to you about this subject from a different perspective, perhaps that you've not thought about. So I want to talk to you about the purpose for prayer why humans should pray. Every religion prays. Buddhists pray. Hindus pray. Muslims pray. Baha'i pray. And they chant. So prayer is not unique to Christians. You're not unique because you pray. All religions pray. Some of them pray more than Christians. Muslims they face Mecca, wherever they are in the airport or food store or the streets in New York, and they pray sometimes four times a day. Most of you don't pray unless someone tells you, let's pray. So the Muslims pray more than you. The Hindus, 
They offer up sacrifices to six million gods every day. They offer food and they serve the gods with their meat and their drink in the night while you sleep and watch TV. They pray more than you. So everybody's praying. Uh, the, the question is, who are they praying to? And are they receiving any answers? But I think the more important question is, why is it in the human spirit to reach out to a supreme being somewhere and cry out? All humans have deep in their spirits, even the atheists who claim to be atheists, in their secret heart, still ask the question, where is he? But here's the mystery about prayer. Prayer is the smallest meeting in every church. No matter how big Sunday mornings are in your church, visit the prayer meeting and you'll know the real church. And usually those meetings are filled with old people who have nothing else to do. We call them intercessors. <laughs> and we let them work while we watch ball games and drink tea and go to movies. We let them pray for us, which is completely unscriptural. As a matter of fact, it may surprise you that there's no such thing as a ministry of prayer in the Bible. There's no gift of prayer anywhere in the Bible. Take a deep breath. So stop telling people you've been called to pray. According to Jesus, all men, everywhere, he says, should lift up holy hands and pray without ceasing. All men. Not a few old people who are retired. But our religion has developed this strange attitude toward prayer. And we would dress in our best clothing on Sunday mornings and go through a ritual called a service and then never attend prayer meetings on Wednesday evenings. I've gone to churches where there were 5,000 people on Sundays and 50 in a prayer meeting during the week. Question, why don't people go to prayer meetings and why don't they pray? The answer is not difficult because I had the same problem. We don't pray because we don't get answers. We don't see results. And the human spirit is built in such a way that we avoid things that don't give us results. It's like going to a soda machine and putting in your money and you press the button and nothing comes out. So you take some more money out and you put it in the machine. You press the button and nothing comes out. And you put some more money in the machine. You press the button, nothing comes out. And then you put your fist into the machine. <laughs> and what do you do? You never come back to that machine. That's the way prayer is for most people. They used to go to prayer meetings, but they didn't see any results. And I understand that, and that's quite logical. But the problem is, we don't pray because we don't even understand it most of the time. Prayer is the most misunderstood kingdom concept on earth. And yet, it's the most important practice humans should be involved in. Prayer is more important than worshiping, singing. It's more important than preaching. As a matter of fact, Jesus said the very purpose for building a place of worship is not to sing. He came to the temple one day and he saw them in their beautiful garb. And they had their regalia on and they were going through the, all the rituals and they were burning the lambs and cutting up the, the heifer and they were, they were dealing with all this ritual and they were even selling and, you know, doves and getting ready for the sacrifice. And he used a whip. And he drove them out of the building. And he said this while he drove them. My father's house 
supposed to be called not a house of singing, not a house of preaching, he says. These things are good, but he said the real issue for coming together in this place, he says, is to what? A house of prayer. Amen. He made prayer more important than preaching. And yet, it's the smallest meeting in the church. So something's wrong. Prayer is the most important kingdom key on earth. And there's no way to understand prayer unless you change your concept about God and about the kingdom. People don't pray. They talk about it. We buy books on prayer and never pray. <laughs> Just like your cookbooks. <laughs> we buy cookbooks but never make anything from the recipes. <laughs> so we got 10 cookbooks by all the great writers. Beautiful prayer books and we don't pray. And again, the reason is because we don't get results. Now, I want to ask you some questions about this because John Wesley said something that I thought was very important. He said, without God, it seems, man cannot. And without man, God will not. I want to repeat this. Somehow in his mind, he discovers something that I discovered myself. He said, it seems as if when it comes to things on earth, without God, man cannot. But it also seems that without man, God will not do anything. In other words, what happens on earth depends on you. I define prayer, and you'll find this in many of my books because I practice this every day. Prayer is defined, in my experience, as earthly license for heavenly interference. Let me put it this way. God depends on you to give him earthly license for him to interfere in earth's affairs. In essence, prayer is not an option to God. It's a necessity. Because God cannot do anything in earth without your giving him access through you. Now that sounds amazing. But the more I study and the more I read this wonderful book, I begin to see that God has set up a system that he himself will not violate. Because prayer was the only thing that the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to a verse you never saw before. <laughs> Luke chapter 11. And I want you to read the way it's written. Now, if you were with a guy for 30 days or three and a half years, like they were, and you saw him walk on the water, speak to a tree, and it died, Cast out demons with his own words. Cleanse a leper by touching. If you saw a guy who would touch an eye that was blind and they could see it and touch a dumb tongue and it could talk. If you, if you were with a guy who, who could speak to the wind and it stopped blowing and the water and it went back to sleep, wouldn't you say, show me how to do that? I mean, you know, let's think about it, you know, man, we're from America, you know, we want to know how to do this thing so we could capitalize on this, make some money. <laughs> Capitalism. So we would say, show us how to walk on water. Show us how to talk to a tree. Show us how to cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. Come on, Jesus, show us. They never asked him, which was strange to me. The only thing they ever asked him to teach them was how to pray. Now, I figured out why. I want you to read this statement because it's very important. It says, one day, verse 1, Jesus was praying in a certain place. By the way, uh, I also discovered that Jesus never prayed with them. Come on, scholars, don't look at me like that. Go do your own research. 
Nowhere in the four Gospels did Jesus pray with his disciples. He always went alone. When you read the scriptures, he would say things like, wait here. And then it says he went alone to pray. He says, go over there. I'll go to the mountain to pray. He always was by himself. You know what that means? Most of us don't have a personal prayer life. We like group prayer lives. Mm, wow. That's good. You are not serious until you have a personal prayer life. So he's in a certain place. Now read the way it's written. It says one day he was praying where? In a certain place. Now look at the next statement. When he had finished, hmm, one of his disciples came to him and said, now that means that he was praying and they were watching. <laughs> and they waited till he was finished. They were looking through the bush, you know. <laughs> he always went to the hills, you know, to pray. And they're watching. And when he was finished, the disciples said to him, Lord, uh, teach us to do what you're doing. Read it. Teach us how to pray like you. And I asked God for years, why is that the only thing they asked him to teach them? And the answer is very simple. When you study the four Gospels, you assess the prayer life of Jesus, you will discover that Jesus prayed every morning. Rising early in the morning, the Bible says, he went to a solitary place to pray. He kept repeating it. As was his custom, it says, he went to a solitary place to pray. And then the Bible would say, he went to pray a great while before day. Let me quote that again. He went to pray, as was his custom, a great while before day. I've been going to Israel for over 34 years. And day in the Middle East begins around 4 a.m. That's when they gather up their goods to take to the market. And they take their herds. In the day of Jesus, day could begin as early as 3 a.m. They still get up early today to take their wares to the market. That means Christ would get up before the peddlers began to get their merchandise to pray, which means that Jesus probably had to begin prayer around 3 o'clock in the morning and would finish praying when business started at around 7 or 8, which means he would have prayed at least four hours every morning before he even started working. Now calculate this. The disciples lived with him. They followed him everywhere, and they watched him do this thing four hours every day. Then they saw something strange. He would spend four hours by himself doing this thing and four seconds healing a blind man. He spent four hours doing this thing called prayer and spent 60 seconds casting out a demon. He spent four hours doing this thing called prayer and he would spend one second cleansing a leper. And they began to think. You know, men are logical. And he began to think. They said, wait a minute. Four hours, four seconds. Four hours, 60 seconds. He did this for four hours and worked a miracle in four seconds. So this must be more important than miracles. They concluded what we call inductive deductive logic. They deduced that he did this four hours and did these miracles in four seconds, which means that if, if you do this thing for four hours, you can do these things in four seconds. So if you do this thing, you can do these things. He spent four hours with God Four seconds with men. Do you know how you do it in your city? Reversed. You spend four seconds with God, bless you Lord, amen, and then you go to try and heal somebody for four hours. Come out, come out, I bind you, 
Come out. Come out, devil. I say, come out. You take over, man. I'm tired. Okay. Come out. Come out. And you work. Prayer to Jesus was more important than healing because prayer qualified him to heal. One time, the disciples tried to cast out a demon. You remember how embarrassed they were? The man brought his son and they couldn't cast a demon out. And Jesus came down from the mountain after prayer. He was praying. He walks down to the village. He says, what's going on here? Big crowd was there. And the man says, I'll tell you what, they won't tell you. <laughs> I brought my son to your disciples. He was, uh, has demon possession, and they couldn't cast a demon out. The first response of Jesus was not to the man, nor the demon, nor the boy. He turned to them first, his disciples. And he said these words. How long must I be with you? Mm -hmm. It was a cry of a frustrated leader. Mm -hmm. He was telling them, don't you get it? You can't just try this stuff unless you do what I do in the morning. And then he went to the boy and he told the demon, get out. The demon left. Mm -hmm. Everybody was amazed. He told the man, take your boy home. At lunch later that afternoon, it was a quiet lunch. <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk. Total embarrassment, and he knew it. He was enjoying every minute of it, I'm sure. Quite the same, mm -hmm, that whole y'all. And then somebody built up the courage to say something, and you know who that was. And Peter said, Master, okay, I know all of us are thinking it, I'll just ask you. Why could not we cast the demon out of that boy? And Jesus said, because this kind, you can't just pray for some things. You got to dedicate yourself to prayer with fasting. Show how serious you are. This kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. That means dedicate yourself where you even push away the pleasure of food. When I discovered this, my prayer life became more important than any ministry in my life, and it still is today. And this is why I want to chat with you for these few minutes. Because this prayer week doesn't mean you're going to get results. Because you might be praying incorrectly. Jesus prayed more than he ministered. Because he knew that prayer was more important than being with people. He spent four hours with God in the morning and four seconds with men in the day just to heal them. The disciples asked him to teach them to pray because they discovered that his time in the morning with the Father determined his time with men in the day. They figured it out. In other words, they discovered that more time spent with God reduces the time you spend with men. You sit with someone counseling them for two hours and they still don't do what you say. That's frustrating, isn't it? A prayed up life will walk into a situation and give an answer in two seconds and solve a problem. We'd rather be psychologists than prayer warriors. And Jesus began to teach them. The rest of the chapter is a seminar on prayer. He actually taught them. And I wonder to wrap this up by watching how he prayed and how he taught them. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray. Which means that prayer is not an option to a believer. 
He expects it. So is fasting. He never says, if you fast. He says, when you fast. When implies you will do this. Every believer should pray, must pray. But the reason why we don't pray, perhaps it's because, like me, I didn't understand prayer. Now, I'm going to ask some questions. Don't answer them. Just think about them because you asked them already to yourself, but you're afraid to ask them publicly. Here are the questions I had to ask myself. Number one, if God is sovereign, why pray? In other words, if God can do whatever he wants, why should you pray? Second question, if God can move in any way he wishes, why pray? These are important questions. Third question, if God cannot be affected by our influence in prayer, why pray? In other words, we can't control God, so why pray? He's sovereign. My answer is what changed my life when I got it. Here's the answer God gave me. Number one, he says, God is as sovereign as his word. Number two, God chose to limit himself to his own word. Number three, God chose never to violate his own word. Number four, God's holiness protects his integrity in breaking his word. And number five, when God speaks, his word becomes law. Now, why are these important? Because prayer was born in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God began to speak. Let me quote what God said. Let us make man in our own image and our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, cattle of the field, and over all that grows in the earth and over all the earth and over everything that creeps upon the ground. Quote God. Let me read it slowly because you missed it. And God, what? Said. Who's talking? God. Let them have dominion. Everybody say, let them. them. Say it loud. One more time. Let them them is a serious statement. If I said to you, let those three ladies go outside, what am I saying to the rest of us? Stay in here. Let them implies you are activated, but not me. And that's when prayer was born. God has a planet. He places you on it, and he begins to talk, and he says, let them have dominion. Now, let us create them, but let them have dominion over the earth. He didn't say, let us have dominion. I wish he had. Because when God says, let them have dominion over the earth, he was taking himself out of earth and turning the future of earth over to his children. He was telling you, you are responsible for what happens down there, and I'm not involved. Now, here's the problem. When God speaks, his word becomes law. The Bible says he has placed his word above his own name. You know the word name, Hebrew, it's the character of the person. It actually means the, the very being. God says, I place my word above myself, which means once I speak, I myself will not break my own word. And God said, let them have dominion over the earth, which means God locked himself out of earth. Now, who was God speaking to when he said, let them? Answer, he was speaking to you. Who are you? You are a human. What is a human? A human is a miracle. A human is a combination. The word human is from two words put together. It's from the word humus, which means dirt, and man, Ish in Hebrew, referring to the spirit being that God created. So a human is a spirit in a dirt body. Follow me carefully, please. So you are really a miracle. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit, but you live in an earth suit. And that's who God said, have dominion over the earth, which means that the only creature that God gave legal authority on earth to function is a human. Let me say it again. The only creature given divine legal rights to function on earth is a human. 
What's a human? A spirit with a dirt body. Now I'm going to say something. You can believe me afterwards. Like six months after you figure it out. Here it is. Therefore, any spirit on earth without a body is illegal. If you don't understand this, you won't understand prayer. <laughs> Let me say it again. Any spirit on earth without a body is illegal because the only creatures God gave legal authority to do on earth is a human. That's why demons are illegal. They have no bodies. That's why they want your body. They're trying to become legal. Hmm. And that's why when Adam and Eve was in the garden, Satan himself could not do business without a body. So he negotiated with the snake who had a dirt body and said, loan me your body. And he used that dirt vessel to communicate with Eve. And God says to the snake, you will never walk again. You will crawl on your belly because you allowed an unemployed cherub to use your body. We know the rest of the story. He beguiled the woman. That means he literally mesmerized her. She disobeyed God. Now here's my problem. God in heaven who made the heavens and earth. He is the most powerful, awesome God. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is almighty. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shishkanu, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom. All powerful God. 500 million galaxies came out of him. He's all powerful. And yet he couldn't stop a little woman from picking a fruit. Have you ever asked yourself that question? He could have saved the human race. But the problem was, he was a spirit. He locked himself out. So he couldn't interfere. Do you know why? If he had interfered, he would have broken his word. And if you break his word once, you can never trust him again. And God said, I will never break my word. You could say that the fall of man was a result of God's faithfulness to his word. Too deep for you. <laughs> so, but the, and the, listen, and the devil knew this. He used to live with God. He knows God. He knew God can't come in. He was happy. But he forgot that God could still talk. So let me paraphrase Genesis 3. And the Lord God said to Satan, verse 15, 3, verse 15. Devil, you know I can't come in right now because you know I don't have a body. Yeah, you're right. I'll never break my word. But I make you a promise, devil. Verse 15. Uh -huh. And he said to the devil, the same woman you used, watch him now, to destroy my program. I'm going to use that same woman and I'm going to come into her womb boom, and she's going to build around me a dirt body and I'm going to come into the earth legally and I'm going to crush your head legally. That's what he said. That's why God loves women. And that's why God couldn't come in. Because he didn't want Satan to accuse him of breaking his own word. So he made a promise. The woman shall have a seed. And I will come into the earth with a body. Isaiah saw the details. Isaiah says, for unto us a child will be born and a son will be given. In chapter 7 he says, and the Lord himself shall give you a sign. That the virgin shall be with child. I shall bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. God inside a man's body. Give God a praise for coming in legally. And from the day God made that promise, the devil knew he's going to keep this word. 
And every generation, Satan killed babies, killed babies. And Moses killed babies. And when Christ was born, the angels sang. Because God made it into the human race. Boom. Into Mary's womb. And Mary built a body around the seed, the Holy Spirit. And God entered the human race legally. And Satan tried to kill that baby. And God preserved that child out of Egypt. And Jesus comes to earth. Now God is legal. Without breaking his word, he's in the earth. He has an earth suit. And his job now is to retrain the children. How to take dominion back from the one who stole it from them. Legally. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when he went to the cross, he went to the garden and he prayed a prayer. His prayer was this, Father, Father means source, <laughs> is there another way to do this? No answer. Why? Because that meeting that took place before anything was, was over. He was dead before he died. He was slain before the foundation of the world. But his body was crying out. Can I say something that probably you won't understand? The body is called Jesus. The spirit is called Christ. Jesus made Christ legal. Hmm. Spirits cannot die. So Christ needed Jesus to die for us. Spirits have no blood. So Jesus had to provide the blood for Christ to pay the sacrifice for us. He needed that body. And when that body knew, I'm going to the cross, the pain, the nails, the whip, the glass in my flesh, the spit, the flesh began to talk. To the host. Jesus began to talk to Christ. Is there another way to do this? And the answer came. He answered his own prayer. Not my will. But thine be done Lord. And he went to the cross. Now I'm going to close. He goes to the cross. And Jesus is hung on the cross. With Christ on the inside. He pays the price for our redemption to restore us back to our sanity. The blood came out of Jesus, paid the price for our redemption. And now he's about to complete the assignment. And he cries out, Father, do not forsake me. That was Jesus crying out to Christ, don't leave me. You promise you're coming back for me in three days. The Bible didn't say he actually died. It says he expired. Expired means to release. <sighs> Jesus released Christ. That's why the Bible says Jesus died. And they took Jesus and put him in the grave. And Christ went down to Hades and to Sheol and to Gehenna to pick up some keys. I'm about to preach it before I go. <laughs> And Christ walks into the dungeons of hell and Satan looks at Christ coming down there and says, how did you get down here? You can't come down here unless you had a body. And Christ says, I got one upstairs on ice. I qualify to be here. But you can't come down here unless you had sin in your body to die. And he says, I got a body full of sin. I collected all of their sins, put it in my body. And he walks up to Satan, looks him in the face and pulls out of his hands three keys, death, hell, and the grave, and said to him, I'll be back. <laughs> Somebody shout amen. amen. And he walks out. The Bible says he went and he unlocked the cells of those who had died in faith. And the Bible says when he arose again, the graves were open. He was telling Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Daniel, Esau, everyone, come out of here. You are now free. I paid the price. And they rose, the Bible says. And he went into the heavenlies, presented the blood on the throne. 
The father says, good job. Watch him now. And now Christ is in heaven finishing the job and Jesus is in the tomb. And Christ says, I got to go back to earth because I'm not finished. I almost could hear an angel say, but you can't go down there because you need a body. And Christ says, I got one on ice. Because I need a body to be legal, you see? And he comes back to earth and he goes back into the body of Christ. And Jesus comes back. The Bible says Christ raised Jesus from the dead. Very important words. Christ raised Jesus from the dead. I can hear Jesus saying, whew, good to see you again. <laughs> give God a hand for resurrection power. Come on, give God a hand for resurrection power. Resurrection power. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now Jesus Christ is about to complete his work. He comes back from the grave. He meets with you and me, his disciples, and he says some strange things. He said, I must go back now. He said, but I'll, I'll be right back. I won't leave you, but I'm leaving. Christ is in Jesus again, but he's trapped. He said, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't get rid of this body, I can't live in all the bodies. And he led them out to a hill. He met with them just before he reached the hill and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. He began to multiply himself. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled. And then he walked out to a hill. And Jesus left. What did I say? Jesus left. Not Christ. Now Christ is a spirit. And without a body, he's illegal. Some of y'all are too smart. Look at you there. So, so the disciples and the mountain looking up, and there goes Jesus. And they said, oh my goodness, Jesus, he's gone. And they stayed there for hours staring. Remind me of some churches, they just stared. <laughs> and an angel came and said, this same, not Christ, Jesus that you see leaving shall return in like manner. Go to Jerusalem, he says. Wait for that power to be ignited that you received in that room. The baptism in the Holy Ghost. And they went to the room. And here comes the fire that ignites the power of the church. The church was born on the day of Pentecost, the day of giftings of God. And now, sitting in this room, God is still on earth. Christ is still here. And he still has a dirt body. He is still legal. That's why the church is never called the body of Jesus. Because that one is in heaven praying for you. The church is called the body of Christ. Come on, give him praise right here to somebody. Give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 Everybody stand up, please, including those who don't want to. Stand up. Be obedient. Let's remain standing. This ministry provides you for a job. You get paid here. And the people that pay your salary are the people who wrote this prayer request. And some of you have been hired here and you have no interest in God. And you're being paid from people's monies who believe in God. Honor these people. Don't come here just because of a salary. Try and understand what's going on here. You are feeding your children from people's gifts. 
Watch your attitude. You are here to be God's presence on earth. So when you leave here today, remember that Christ is going to your office. He's going back to your construction area. He's going back to the studio. He's going back to the mailroom. He's going back to type on a computer. He's legal. And listen to me carefully. Please don't forget this. And whenever you feel sick, any kind of disease, even a head cold, remember this. God doesn't want your body. He needs your body. So tell him, heal me, not for my sake. Heal me for your sake. Stop praying selfishly and say, God, keep me alive so you could have a vessel 50 years more. Take away this pain, this arthritis. Take away this cancer cell. Remove this diabetic issue. Why? You need my body to stay legal. God will heal you today. Stop praying selfishly in a miss. Pray for God to keep you alive so he could be on earth legally. You are the body of Christ. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Lift your hands. Even if you don't believe in him, lift your hands and thank him anyhow. Thank him for a body that belongs to him because he lives in us. And without him, you would have no job. Father, I give you praise. I thank you today that you created our bodies for yourself. You said in your word, even as food is for the stomach and stomach for food, even so the body is for God and God for the body. Live through us this week. Use us to be intercessors for the kingdom of God on earth. Let us touch heaven through our faith in you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would extend everybody's life another 50 years. Let there be healings in this place because of this message today. And thank you, Lord, that something good is about to happen in this place because the kingdom of God in Christ is here today. Give God a big shout of praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you very much.